Well, today we'd like to talk about uh, Henry Leland. Uh, many of you may not even know who Henry Leland is, and it's because he's one of the more obscure uh, early automobile uh, uh, people. And I thought it was worth some time to spend some time understanding who he is. And if you notice down here in the bottom, it says Cadillac. And that's because Henry Leland played a big part in the uh, early days of Cadillac. Henry founded two luxury automobile companies. Both of them exist today. And that's Cadillac and Lincoln. If you notice on the top of this Lincoln sign here, it says Leland built. And uh, both of these are now over a century old. Both still are going just fine. And uh, except for automotive buffs, many people don't realize uh, how he played such an important part in the early days of these two companies. In fact, the two companies themselves uh, spend little time uh, talking about uh, Henry Leland. So who was Henry Leland? And who was Cadillac or why Cadillac? Well, many of the early uh, companies, uh, such as Duesenberg, Cord, Buick, Chrysler, and so on, uh, all uh, got their names from their developers. And uh, uh, if you get down to the bottom there, uh, why don't we have a Leland automobile? If he is so important with Cadillac, why wasn't it called a Leland automobile? Leland was born in 1843 in Vermont. He was born in a Quaker family, hardworking family, very, very stra straightforward uh, family. His dad was a farmer and a teamster, and uh, the two combination of the two was getting his father down. He was worn out, and he finally decided to quit farming and being a teamster and move to Massachusetts in 1857 and get involved in the textile industry. That happened, that worked, and uh, Leland actually began working in the textile in industry at the age of 11. Now, he's probably a gopher, but it got him a start. And uh, he eventually became an apprentice uh, machinist. He married uh, Ellen uh, Hull in 1897, and they had uh, one son and two daughters. Now, there's not much uh, in, the, in history about the two daughters, but Wilford played a very important part in, in these early days. Uh, he was a, a, a shadow of um, Henry Leland. He uh, was uh, with Henry throughout his career. And uh, although we don't I won't be talking about uh, Wilford, uh, he, he was uh, there every step of the way. Henry died in 1932. And uh, in all my research, I found that uh, he was, had a nickname of the grand old man of Detroit. So who was Cadillac? Well, I'm gonna let you figure out how to pronounce his name, but he was a French explorer, and he uh, explored up on the Canadian border uh, on the, on the uh, uh, Great Lakes, and he claimed an area, which is now where Detroit exists, in the late 1600s. Later, he actually was appointed governor of Louisiana in 1711. So as we said, Leland was born in 1843, and uh, he grew up in the machine age. Now the machine age, you could compare that to our current uh, uh, dot-com age uh, in the fact that the kids growing up, uh, that, was, that was their life. They got involved in the computer games. He uh, really enjoyed the machinery, and uh, so he got himself an apprentice job in the textile industry and he took a big interest in precision uh, machining. Well, the Civil War broke out, and uh, he went to work for Springfield Armory. Now, Springfield Armory was making weapons, and they realized that making a weapon was one thing, but making parts was a second thing. You could send a weapon to a, to a troop in the, in the front line, but if that weapon broke for whatever reason, it was worthless, and you'd have to send him a new weapon. But if, if they could provide parts to that weapon, then they could change the parts on the battlefield and uh, you didn't have to make a new weapon. The parts could be available and uh, the, the uh, uh, soldier could continue to fight. So they were making a stab at interchangeability of parts. Well, after the war, he continued that pursuit of precision 
and he went to work for Colt. Now, Colt was making revolvers, and uh, they had a, uh, uh, a need for uh, a, a precision, and uh, he continued to learn how to make precision equipment. So his next step was 1872, and he went to work for Brown and Sharp. They were the premier manufacturers of precision measuring tools, and uh, this gave him an, ex an opportunity to even pursue more of the uh, precision in, in machining. And uh, out of that came sort of three interesting things, I guess. Sewing machines, uh, Brown and Sharp got a, a uh, contract uh, to build sewing machines, commercial sewing machines. And the reason for building these, uh, Brown and Sharp doing it, is these were machines that were heavily used and the parts had to be exact and long lasting. And so he got involved in the sewing machine business. And along with that, they got a contract for building a thousand pairs of clippers for clipping horses. Well, he took a big interest in this, and he found that the best way to determine the quality of the tool of, of clippers was the finest hair he could find was calves' uh, pelts. So he would stretch out a calf's pelt, and he'd run the clipper from one end of the calf's pelt to the other and brush off any hairs that were left on the clippers, and then he would look, and if there was any hairs stuck in between the, the uh, uh, shears, he says, no good, send it back, continue to machine it. Well, this is where the first uh, barber shears started uh, for, that we're so used to today. And you know when one of those gets dull and it pulls a hair, it's not very comfortable. And he was the one that uh, uh, went to the highest quality of machining so that you didn't have uh, pulled hairs. Again, he was, he was honing his skills uh, in, in uh, precision. 1890, he opened Leland and Falconer Machine Shop in, in Detroit. He had a friend in Detroit, visited him. His friend introduced him to a, a man by the name of Falconer, who was a, uh, uh, a lumber tycoon, timber tycoon, had money, and Leland uh, had the skills. Two of them got together. And between the two, they, Falconer's money and Leland's uh, skills, they opened the, the, uh, the Leland and Falconer machine shop. They specialized in gear production, but they would produce anything. They were, there was only six machine shops in Detroit at this time, and Detroit was becoming the uh, hotbed of, of automobiles or, and, uh, and machinery. So they had a, a, a great uh, uh, clientele, and uh, he could produce accuracy down to five ten thousandths of an inch. Now we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but to give you an idea of what that is in just a second. He got very familiar with the automobile business with Oldsmobile. And uh, Olds, uh, Olds recognized that uh, uh, Leland was making quality equipment and uh, gave him a contract to build the Oldsmobile engines. While this, was, this contract was being pursued, the engines were being built, uh, Leland started looking at how he could build that engine even better. And uh, he found that he could build an engine that was probably upwards of maybe three times more powerful than the engine that Oldsmobile had asked him to build. And he put that engine in his curved dash Oldsmobile, which was the car that Oldsmobile was building at that time. And, uh, <clears throat> And, and drove it over to the Oldsmobile factory and said, look what a better car you'd have if you had my new engine. They said, well, yeah, you're probably right, but they just recovered from a devastating fire. They saved one car out of their factory. Everything else burned down. They also had contract now for, uh, for many cars that people had already purchased, and there was no way that they could take on the machining of a new engine at the same time uh, get re recover from the fire. And they said, go away, we, we can't uh, uh, do all this at once. So what's he gonna do with this engine that he built? Well, he put it in his own curved dash Oldsmobile and started driving the car uh, as a personal car. His big break came in 1902 when he was asked to appraise the failed Henry Ford Company. 
Now, without getting too far away here, we need to talk a little bit about Henry Ford. Henry Ford had three companies. The first two companies failed. And we're now talking about the second company. The, this Henry Ford company is his second company. And uh, he went on to the Ford Motor Company, which is the company we know today. But uh, what happened was he and his financiers couldn't get along. And there's many reasons for this. Uh, the easy one is he wanted to build uh, a, a car for the masses, and his uh, financiers wanted to build an expensive car, a luxury car. They thought that's where the money was. And uh, this thing finally fell apart. Uh, Ford leaves the company, and his financiers now are holding the, the sack on a company with nobody to build a car. So they decide to liquidate and they needed to find out what the value of the facility was. And they knew Henry Ford, uh, they knew Leland, who was a, a super machinist. They invited him in to appraise their company. Well, <coughs> excuse me, while he's appraising the company, he started thinking, you know, if I put my engine in that Ford car, I'll bet we'd have something that would really sell. So when he goes back to, uh, to uh, give him, the, to give the report to the, um, uh, Ford directors, he uh, takes this engine out of his car and hand carries it into the room and said, look at what we could do with your car and my engine. Well, they liked what they saw. And so they reorganized the Ford company and uh, to incorporate L&F, uh, Leland and Falconer, into the company. So they were just a piece of the company. They were, they were providing the, the uh, machinery for their car, and uh, the company itself, the old company, was providing the chassis and, and the body. But they now had a reorganized company. They renamed it Cadillac. So let's take a look at the first year of Cadillac. Here we have the first year of Cadillac. We actually have one in the museum and uh, uh, nice looking car. So what are we looking at here? This is the right hand side. Is that the left hand side? No, that's the Ford car. Can you tell the difference? Not much. And we also have in the museum uh, the Ford, Ford car. So you can come to the museum and see these two cars almost side by side or head to head. And, and they are almost identical, not quite, but very close. Now, what, what caused this? Well, there's a lot of speculation, but uh, obviously whatever Ford left behind and, uh, Cat and uh, Leland used to pr produce the Cadillac uh, was almost identical car. So let's talk a little bit about the quest for accuracy. Calipers, this tool here, was developed in 1851. And this became the standard at the turn of the century for measuring accuracy or precision. And it could measure down to one hundredth of an inch. A good machinist could measure to a hundredth of an inch. Not everybody, but a good machinist could do that. So what is a hundredth of an inch? Well, your human hair is about two, two, two hundredths of an inch in diameter. Credit card, approximately thirty uh, uh, thousandths of an inch. This goes back to the old days of uh, uh, having um, points in your automobile. And when those points had a tendency to, to wear and burn out, and when it happened in an inopportune time, and you had to readjust the points in your car and the ignition points, uh, the old rule of thumb is get out of a matchbook. Everybody had a matchbook because everybody smoked, and the thickness of the matchbook cover was 30 thousandths, and you'd set your points to that, and away you go. So let's take a look at an early machine shop. <laughs> Excuse me. This is actually a Ford shop. And these tools that you see down here, see this, this piece here and here and here, those are grinders. And they were grinding all of these um, uh, crankshafts to their final dimensions. These crankshafts were rough uh, in the sense of dimensions. They were coming out of the foundry and had maybe some machining done, but the final machining was done by grinding. And these are the grinders. Well, here, how many of them can you see? Each one of those would have had a, 
a man, a person, standing there running that machine. Some of them would have been machinists. Other ones might have been apprentice. Do you think they could all measure to a thousandth of an inch? Do you think, do you think that maybe they might have dropped their tool during the day and got it out of, a, out of whack? The uh, quality of precision was not very good at that period of time. So Henry thinks about this. And his comment he made to the Ford Motor Company, now Cadillac, was that manufacturing had to be as perfect as humans could make it. And he recognized that the general accuracy was one, one uh, thousandth of an inch. But his wrist pins, to have uh, quality wrist pins in his, these are the pins that hold the uh, piston and the, the uh, uh, rod together, had to be accurate to five ten thousandths of an inch. That's half of that one thousandth that was, that was considered uh, accurate at the time. So he was the first company in the United States to purchase what were called Joe blocks. Joe blocks were built by, uh, uh, developed by a guy by the name of Johansson in uh, Sweden. And this is a set of Joe blocks. And what you could do is you could stack these blocks together. We're gonna to come back to this in a minute. You could stack these blocks together to get the dimension you wanted. And then you could take the caliper and put these blocks in there and you could get the, the measurement you want. And then you could set the, the caliper to, that, uh, to where that was measuring accurately. Well, that was pretty good, but you're still using a caliper. So Leland went one step farther and he started to build go, no-go gauges. <coughs> now, what this is, is one, di one side is bigger than the other, and this is for a circle. And um, let's say you drill a hole in a piece of steel, and that hole had to be accurate. Well, you put this go, no ga go gauge in there. If the um, gauge went through, it meant that the hole was big enough. But if you turned it around and put this other end through it and it didn't go, then you knew that the hole was, it was okay because the no-go side wouldn't go through it. And so you could make these up for all those people on that assembly line and give them one of these tools. And, and uh, this is again for a hole, but you could do it for anything. And uh, the machinist then could determine whether what he did was accurate or not. If it wasn't, you send it back and start over. What's interesting is, and this is what they call ringing, is when you stack these things to get the dimension you wanted, you just don't stick them together. You put them together at 90 degrees and you twist. And those pieces of, of metal or ceramic are so flat that when you s squeeze those together, you can't pull them apart. Uh, it's, it's like a magnet, but there's no magnetic forces there at all. It's strictly there's no air in there. Air pressure is holding them together. They're stuck together. <coughs> and they're so stuck together that if you leave these stuck together overnight, you may never get them apart. The molecular um, interf interface between those two pieces, the uh, uh, molecules or the uh, atoms start to go between them, and they basically weld themselves together. And, and you, and, and, ooh, I, I'm sorry. They weld themselves together to the point that that's what you got, that chunk of metal. So as soon as you get the dimension you want, you have to twist them again 90 degrees and slide them off. Otherwise, they're not even going to come apart. So very accurate. These were maintained in a, uh, in a room by themselves with uh, uh, high quality machinists uh, determined stacking them to get the dimensions they wanted and uh, uh, these were kept completely separate from the works on the field so let's talk about some of the, the, the major accomplishments uh, in the automotive world by Henry Leland in, in uh, 1908 he uh, worked to uh, set up a standardization of auto parts demonstration in England in 1912, they developed the electric starter. 1915, 
It was the uh, first production of a V8 engine. Uh, 1918 helped build the Liberty engine for World War I, and 1919 started the Lincoln Motor Company. Standardization, probably the biggest accomplishment in, in his career. At that time, if you had a car and it broke down, you couldn't go into your local Napa store and pick up a part. You had to go to the factory. The factory would send you a blank, I mean, a piece that might fit, send it to you. You had to take it to a machine shop, and the machine shop had to machine that part to fit your car. So, so if you were traveling, this wasn't just go down and get a part and add it and, and rebuild your car. car. Uh, <clears throat> there was no auto parts stores available, and through the insistence of perfection and accuracy, Cadillac was the first company to have standardized parts, where you could buy a part from the factory, put it on your car, and the car would run. In 1908, a demonstration was put together that proved this point. It was done in England and it was under the supervision of the Royal Automobile Club. They took three Cadillacs directly off the ship, of a shipment of Cadillacs to England. The three were dismantled completely, right down to the last nut and bolt. They mixed all the parts together, over 2,000 parts. They pulled 89 pieces out of that pile of parts, put, replaced them with 89 pieces from the factory that were replacement parts, and then they reassembled the cars. There's car one, you can't see its sign, car two, car three, and they started assembling the parts here from the mixture. They put those three cars back together out of that pile. They all ran 500 miles. Now, not only did they run 500 miles, Two of them started on the first crank. The third one started on the second crank. Because of that, Cadillac was presented with a Dewar Trophy from the Royal Automobile Club. Dewar sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a Scotch. It's the same guy. He was a uh, member of parliament, uh, I guess well-to-do. He started the Dewar Scotch Company, and he underwrote the Royal Automobile Club in presenting the Dewar Trophy for the greatest automobile advancement in 1908. They did this for in many years uh, during that period, uh, and it was uh, backed by Dewar. This year, 1908, it was for the standard, <coughs> excuse me, for the standardization and interchangeable of parts. Out of that, Cadillac coined the logo standard of the world. You probably have seen this sign somewhere over your uh, years. Uh, notice this one was a big sign. It was put up by, it was an outdoor sign. And this picture over here on the, on the left, uh, that's Wilford's son. Now, Wilford was the son of Leland, who followed Leland uh, as a shadow. And uh, Wilford's son uh, fit into the, into the cup. In 1909, Cadillac was purchased by General Motors. Now, General Motors was started just a year before uh, by uh, Durant, and uh, he'd already purchased Buick and Oldsmobile, and he wanted a luxury car uh, above and beyond Oldsmobile and, and, and Buick, and so he went after Cadillac. And Leland and Wilford, Wilford was the negotiator on this, uh, finally agreed to uh, uh, sell out to GM. Well, it was a pretty good deal. Leland uh, stayed on as chief executive. He had free reign. He could do whatever he wanted with the company. But of course, all the money flowed back to GM. But he still had his company. He could do it his way. And uh, they developed a very fine automobile. This arrangement lasted until 1917. And that's when the Liberty Engine pro uh, Project took over uh, and during the war. And we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Uh, um, Cadillac was a sort of a different car than uh, was being built anywhere else. They were on the, um, uh, on the frontier, you might say. There was no roads. Uh, if the roads were there. There were, of course, no pavement. 
compared to the Eastern cars, such as Pierce Arrow or somebody like that, they were selling cars to uh, well-to-do people in the cities where you did have roads and pavement. And uh, so their cars were refined uh, for that type of service where uh, uh, Cadillac's cars were a much stronger car uh, meant for uh, harder use. Now, in 1912, he invented the self-starter. Cranking a car is very dangerous. It's the easiest way there is to break your arm. And uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, the reason that he developed the this, this starter was because of a friend of his that was killed by uh, the crank in an automobile. A friend of his was going along the road one day, found a woman in distress got out to help her, went to crank his, her car for her. The car backfired or kicked back. And in doing so, the, the crank hit the guy in the face. And uh, he didn't die immediately, but died shortly thereafter in the hospital from the, the uh, wounds that he received with this crank hitting him in the face. Let's talk about that a little bit better. Here's, here's some guys cranking a car now. I don't know where this is, but it's not in the U.S. because that sign, if you can read it, it talks about liters, not uh, quarts. And uh, you can tell, well, cars generally, not all, generally are cranked in a clockwise rotation. Well, he's not, he's not ready to pull on that crank. As you can see, he's ready to push on that crank just by the way his, his uh, stature is. And if you also look there, he, he's got his thumb over the crank. He's in trouble. If he pushes down on that crank and that car decides to kick back, just think that crank now gets down here. Where is his head going to be? It's going to be down there. That crank comes back up, hits him in the head, but in route, it broke his thumb off because it, his thumb was over the crank. So the way you crank a car is you pull up on the crank with your thumb on the back side of the crank so that if it comes back, if it kicks, the, the uh, crank's going to go this way, you're going to go that way, and you get out of the way. So this is how people got hurt, cranking a car. So he went to his friend Charles Kettering to solve this problem. Kettering had an engineering lab in Dayton, Ohio, known as the uh, Dayton Engineering Laboratory. Later changed that to Delco, and we're all familiar, I'm sure, with the name Delco. And uh, he previously had worked for the uh, National Cash Register Company. And if you remember, if you've seen pictures of old cash registers, when they put in the price, they'd have to crank it over. It took two cranks. Well, this was time consuming. It would took uh, strength. And National wanted to come up with a way to do this without having to crank. And so uh, Kettering <coughs> invented a, a small, compact, high torque, motor that could be stopped and started instantaneously that could be used to run a cash register. And that, was, that particular motor was the basis for the electric start. Now this is a four-cylinder Cadillac engine early. And here's that electric starter. And I say, what is that? Well, this is a, basically a motor. And you notice the splines on the, on the uh, flywheel. And here is a pinion under here. So when you step on the starter, the battery energizes this motor. And the pinion here turns the uh, flywheel, and the engine starts. When the end, and, you, and you let off on the, on the starter pedal. Well, notice the other end of this has a shaft here. And that shaft is being driven by the front of the engine through the um, uh, timing chain. So as soon as that engine starts, this shaft starts to turn. Meanwhile, you've stopped this mechanism, and so this shaft makes this uh, motor act like a generator, and it starts generating electricity. That generator electricity then is fed back to the battery and to other electrical comp components on the car. So he built what was called a, a um, starter generator, which was a very high, uh, a, a very important invention at the time. Uh, <clears throat> Leland developed three engines 
while uh, working for, while under the leadership, while he had the leadership of Cadillac. Here's the one cylinder engine that he developed. This is the one that he put in the Ford car and they called it a Cadillac. Notice it has a brass uh, uh, water jacket just like the four cylinder car does here. Most cars at that time had a cast iron water jacket and the cylinder was cast in that cast iron water jacket or it was all one. It was hard to clean, hard to get into. And he says, well, why don't I put a copper one on here? That copper one can be taken off. We can clean it out. It gives room for expansion if this engine should be out in the cold weather and you don't have antifreeze. They didn't have antifreeze in those days. Uh, and starts to freeze. It'll take the expansion and, and it'll break. It won't break the engine. So in, in 1905, when he developed the four-cylinder engine, he took this basic configuration and stacked them in four, four cylinders. Now notice there's no starter down here. This is earlier than 1912. <coughs> what you're seeing here, this is the oiling mechanism for the car. In 1915, he was the first mass producer of V8s. Now, 19, in the 1905, the engines were going to four cylinders. But between 1905 and 1915, the luxury cars had all gone to six-cylinder engines. So the four-cylinder engine now was a thing of the past for luxury automobiles, still being used in engines like Dodge and Chevrolet and Ford and what have you, but not in the luxury cars. So he developed a V8. Now look, that, there's four, uh, four cil uh, cylinders right there on one side, the other four are on the other. And look at how compact that engine is compared to, to Packard that was building a straight eight engine. Imagine that's twice as long and that had to fit under the hood. So he, again, developed something that was very new, modern. He wasn't the first person to develop a V8, but he was the first person to put it in production. 1917, the government wanted the automobile companies or engine companies to get involved in what was called a Liberty engine. This is for World War I. And this was a multi-use engine. It was mainly built for uh, aircraft, but it could be used for many things. Here, here is that engine. Right here, it's got uh, 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 six, six uh, cil cylinders on this side, six on the other side. This is a V12 engine. But you could, you could cut this in half, just pull off some of those cylinders. So you could make this engine any size you wanted. And uh, Packard was big in the production of this engine, the design of the engine, and they invited Leland Cadillac to get involved in that production. Here is Leland standing right here. And uh, our friend uh, Durant from GM says, no, don't want you doing that. Uh, I'm a pacifist. I want to have pacifist company. I don't want you getting involved in any war production. And Cadillac, uh, G, uh, Leland says, well, I've had enough of this. He leaves the company, leaves Cadillac behind. <coughs> Later, GM, uh, they did get involved in the Liberty engine, but not in the design of the engine. Leland starts another company called the Lincoln Motor Company. Why Lincoln? Well, that's the first, first person he voted for. He was dead now, but he thought highly of Lincoln, so he named it the Lincoln Motor Car Company, Lincoln Motor Company. 1919, the war ended. They'd barely gotten this Liberty engine into production. And uh, uh, so there was no more demand for the Liberty engine. And so he decided to go into luxury car development production. But life was tough after the war. There was depression. He had a big tax bill that he owed uh, through, the, through the war. And uh, he was, uh, became insolvent. They had to, they had to uh, abandon the company. Well, Ford purchased the company. Why did he do that? Well, probably for a couple reasons. One was he wanted to get back at Leland for building a Cadillac. And uh, uh, secondly, he wanted to find a home for Edsel. Edsel was his son, who he and Edsel weren't getting along very well. And so he thought if he could get Edsel another company, he could put Edsel to work with Lincoln and leave Ford to, to Henry Ford. 
oh, that was probably a good deal as it turned out because uh, uh, Edsel built a pretty nice car. Uh, Lincoln built a great car, or Leland built a great car, but he built a very strong mechanical car. He wasn't big for uh, um, beauty. And this is where Edsel came in, and Edsel turned it into a beautiful car. Ford uh, uh, <coughs> left Lincoln, uh, kept um, Leland in charge as his chief executive. But after four months, uh, Ford says, you're out of here. Leland didn't want to leave, and as the story goes, they actually carried him out from the fourth floor in his chair down onto the street. Um, after that, he got involved with uh, civic and labor movement uh, issues. He was very uh, uh, concerned about the labor movement. He was uh, for the labor. Uh, he uh, was thinking they were getting a raw deal in many ways. And he uh, died in 1932. So a few things to think about. Both of the companies that Leland founded are still active today. I'm pretty sure he's the only person that holds that distinction. Both he and his son were considered engineers' engineers, held quality above all things, and Cadillac became known as standard of the world. So here's the grand old man of Detroit in, uh, that's his 1905 Cadillac that he called OCL, Osceola. Osceola was a, uh, a Seminole Indian chief that he thought highly of. This is the first Cadillac that was built with a superstructure on it. Up until this time, they were all open. And you can see why. He was a tall man. He had to build this for him to get into. If it was a very top-heavy car. He turned it over a few times. Anyway, this is the first car he ever drove. This picture was taken in 1930. He died in 1932. It was the last car he ever drove. Thank you. Story of Leland.